Part One, Chapters Thirteen and Fourteen of Democracy in America, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Democracy in America, Volume Two by Alexis de Tocqueville, translated by Henry Reeve. Part One, Chapter Thirteen: Literary Characteristics of Democratic Ages. When a traveller goes into a bookseller's shop in the United States, and examines the American books upon the shelves, the number of works appears extremely great, whilst that of known authors appears, on the contrary, to be extremely small. He will first meet with a number of elementary treatises, destined to teach the rudiments of human knowledge. Most of these books are written in Europe. The Americans reprint them, adapting them to their own country. Next comes an enormous quantity of religious works, Bibles, sermons, edifying anecdotes, controversial divinity, and reports of charitable societies. Lastly appears the long catalogue of political pamphlets. In America, parties do not write books to combat each other's opinions, but pamphlets which are circulated for a day with incredible rapidity, and then expire. In the midst of all these, obscure productions of the human brain are to be found the more remarkable works of that small number of authors whose names are, or ought to be, known to Europeans. Although America is perhaps in our days the civilized country in which literature is least attended to, a large number of persons are nevertheless to be found there who take an interest in the productions of the mind, and who make them, if not the study of their lives, at least the charm of their leisure hours. But England supplies these readers with a larger portion of the books which they require. Almost all important English books are republished in the United States. The literary genius of Great Britain still darts its rays into the recesses of the forests of the New World. There is hardly a pioneer's hut which does not contain a few odd volumes of Shakespeare. I remember that I read the feudal play of Henry V for the first time in a log-house. Not only do the Americans constantly draw upon the treasures of English literature, but it may be said with truth that they find the literature of England growing on their own soil. The larger part of that small number of men in the United States who are engaged in the composition of literary works are English in substance, and still more so in form. Thus they transport into the midst of democracy the ideas and literary fashions which are current among the aristocratic nation they have taken for their model. They paint with colors borrowed from foreign manners, and as they hardly ever represent the country which they were born in as it really is, they are seldom popular there. The citizens of the United States are themselves so convinced that it is not for them that books are published, that before they can make up their minds upon the merit of one of their authors, they generally wait till his fame has been ratified in England, just as in pictures the author of an original is held to be entitled to judge of the merit of a copy. The inhabitants of the United States have, then, at present, properly speaking, no literature. The only authors whom I acknowledge as American are the journalists. They, indeed, are not great writers, but they speak the language of their countrymen, and make themselves heard by them. Other authors are alien. They are, to the Americans, what the imitators of the Greeks and Romans were to us at the revival of learning, an object of curiosity, not of general sympathy. They amuse the mind, but they do not act upon the manners of the people. I have already said that this state of things is very far from originating in democracy alone, and that the causes of it must be sought for in several peculiar circumstances, independent of the democratic principle. If the Americans, retaining the same laws and social condition, had a different origin, and had been transported into another country, I do not question that they would have had a literature. Even as they now are, I am convinced that they will ultimately have one, but its character will be different from that which marks the American literary productions of our time, and that character will be peculiarly its own. Nor is it impossible to trace this character beforehand. I suppose an aristocratic people, amongst whom letters are cultivated, the labors of the mind, as well as the affairs of the state, are conducted by a ruling class in society. The literary, as well as political, career is almost entirely confined to this class, or to those nearest to it in rank. These premises suffice to give me a key to all the rest. When a small number of the same men are engaged at the same time upon the same objects, they easily concert with one another, and agree upon certain leading rules which are to govern them each and all. 
if the object which attracts the attention of these men is literature, the productions of the mind will soon be subjected by them to precious canons, from which it will be no longer allowable to depart. If these men occupy a hereditary position in the country, they will be naturally inclined, not only to adopt a certain number of fixed rules for themselves, but to follow those which their forefathers laid down for their own guidance. Their code will be at once strict and traditional." As they are not necessarily engrossed by the cares of daily life, as they have never been so, any more than their fathers were before them, they have learned to take an interest, for several generations back, in the labours of the mind. They have learned to understand literature as an art, and to love it in the end for its own sake, and to feel a scholar-like satisfaction in seeing men conform to its rules. Nor is this all. The men of whom I speak began and will end their lives in easy or in affluent circumstances. Hence they have naturally conceived a taste for choice gratifications, and a love of refined and delicate pleasures. Nay, more, a kind of indolence of mind and heart, which they frequently contract in the midst of this long and peaceful enjoyment of so much welfare, leads them to put aside, even from their pleasures, whatever might be too startling or too acute. They had rather be amused than intensely excited. They wish to be interested, but not to be carried away. Now let us fancy a great number of literary performances executed by the men, for the men, whom I have just described, and we shall readily conceive a style of literature in which everything will be regular and prearranged. The slightest work will be carefully touched in its least details. Art and labour will be conspicuous in everything. Each kind of writing will have rules of its own, from which it will not be allowed to swerve, and which distinguish it from all others. Style will be thought of almost as much importance as thought, and the form will be no less considered than the matter. The diction will be polished, measured, and uniform. The tone of the mind will be always dignified, seldom very animated, and writers will care more to perfect what they produce than to multiply their productions. It will sometimes happen that the members of the literary class, always living amongst themselves and writing for themselves alone, will lose sight of the rest of the world, which will infect them with a false laboured style. They will lay down minute literary rules for their exclusive use, which will insensibly lead them to deviate from common sense, and finally to transgress the bounds of nature. By dint of striving after a mode of parlance different from the vulgar, they will arrive at a sort of aristocratic jargon, which is hardly less remote from pure language than is the coarse dialect of the people. Such are the natural perils of literature amongst aristocracies. Every aristocracy, which keeps itself entirely aloof from the people, becomes impotent, a fact which is as true in literature as it is in politics. Let us now turn the picture and consider the other side of it, let us transport ourselves into the midst of a democracy, not unprepared by ancient traditions and present culture, to partake in the pleasures of the mind. Ranks are there intermingled and confounded, knowledge and power are both infinitely subdivided, and, if I may use the expression, scattered on every side. Here, then, is a motley multitude, whose intellectual wants are to be supplied." These new votaries of the pleasures of the mind have not all received the same education. They do not possess the same degree of culture as their fathers, nor any resemblance to them. Nay, they perpetually differ from themselves, for they live in a state of incessant change of place, feelings, and fortunes. The mind of each member of the community is therefore unattached to that of his fellow-citizens by tradition or by common habits, and they have never had the power, the inclination, nor the time to concert together. It is, however, from the bosom of this heterogeneous and agitated mass that authors spring, and from the same source their profits and their fame are distributed. I can without difficulty understand that, under these circumstances, I must expect to meet in the literature of such a people, with but few of those strict conventional rules which are admitted by readers and writers in aristocratic ages. If it should happen that the men of some one period were agreed upon any such rules, that would prove nothing for the following period, for amongst democratic nations each new generation is a new people. Amongst such nations, then, literature will not easily be subjected to strict rules, and it is impossible that any such rules should ever be permanent. In democracies it is by no means the case that all the men who cultivate literature have received a literary education, and most of those who have some tinge of belles lettres are either engaged in politics 
or in a profession which only allows them to taste occasionally, and by stealth, the pleasures of the mind. These pleasures, therefore, do not constitute the principal charm of their lives, but they are considered as a transient and necessary recreation amidst the serious labors of life. Such men can never acquire a sufficiently intimate knowledge of the art of literature to appreciate its more delicate beauties, and the minor shades of expression must escape them. As the time they can devote to letters is very short, they seek to make the best use of the whole of it. They prefer books which may be easily procured, quickly read, and which require no learned researches to be understood. They ask for beauties, self-proffered and easily enjoyed. Above all, they must have what is unexpected and new. Accustomed to the struggle, the crosses, and the monotony of practical life, they require rapid emotions, startling passages, truths or errors brilliant enough to rouse them up, and to plunge them at once, as if by violence, into the midst of a subject. Why should I say more? Or who does not understand what is about to follow, before I have expressed it? Taken as a whole, literature in democratic ages can never present, as it does in the periods of aristocracy, an aspect of order, regularity, science, and art. Its form will, on the contrary, ordinarily be slighted, sometimes despised. Style will frequently be fantastic, incorrect, overburdened, and loose, almost always vehement and bold. Authors will aim at rapidity of execution, more than at perfection of detail. Small productions will be more common than bulky books. There will be more wit than erudition, more imagination than profundity, and literary performances will bear marks of an untutored and rude vigor of thought, frequently of great variety and singular fecundity. The object of authors will be to astonish rather than to please, and to stir the passions more than to charm the tastes. Here and there, indeed, writers will doubtless occur who will choose a different track, and who will, if they are gifted with superior abilities, succeed in finding readers, in spite of their defects or their better qualities. But these exceptions will be rare, and even the authors who shall so depart from the received practice in the main subject of their works will always relapse into it in some lesser details. I have just depicted two extreme conditions. The transition by which a nation passes from the former to the latter is not sudden but gradual, and marked with shades of very various intensity. In the passage which conducts a lettered people from the one to the other, there is almost always a moment at which the literary genius of democratic nations has its confluence with that of aristocracies, and both seek to establish their joint sway over the human mind. Such epochs are transient, but very brilliant, they are fertile without exuberance, and animated without confusion. The French literature of the eighteenth century may serve as an example. I should say more than I mean if I were to assert that the literature of a nation is always subordinate to its social conditions and its political constitution. I am aware that, independently of these causes, there are several others which confer certain characteristics on literary productions, but these appear to me to be the chief. The relations which exist between the social and political conditions of a people, and the genius of its authors, are always very numerous. Whoever knows the one is never completely ignorant of the other. CHAPTER fourteen: THE TRADE OF LITERATURE Democracy not only infuses a taste for letters among the trading classes, but introduces a trading spirit into literature. In aristocracies, readers are fastidious and few in number. In democracies, they are far more numerous and far less difficult to please. The consequence is that among aristocratic nations, no one can hope to succeed without immense exertions, and that these exertions may bestow a great deal of fame, but can never earn much money, whilst among democratic nations, a writer may flatter himself that he will obtain at a cheap rate a meagre reputation and a large fortune. For this purpose he need not be admired, it is enough that he is liked. The ever-increasing crowd of readers, and their continual craving for something new, ensure the sale of books which nobody much esteems. In democratic periods the public frequently treat authors as kings do their courtiers. They enrich and they despise them. What more is needed by the venal souls which are born in courts, or which are worthy to live there? Democratic literature is always infested with a tribe of writers who look upon letters as a mere trade, and for some few great authors who adorn it you may reckon thousands of idea-mongers. End of Part 1 Chapters 13 and 14